Welcome to the awesome American Podcast. Today we've got a very special guest. It's very awesome today. We have Lawrence Tan with us here, a man of many accolades, artist, graphic designer, the music, and we'll get this going. Okay. Which tanks now pressurize. Yeah, news certainly does get around, doesn't it? Hello, people of the world. Three or four hot tips a month. There was a fire fight! Wow! It doesn't build character, it reveals Ethan A. Cotton. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Thank you so much for coming here. It's it's you're right. It's been what like ten years or so since we've last. I think I think it's more actually, oh but god. still. Oh my god, man! I remember. I remember, man. I, uh, uh, when did you move on from that college? When did you actually decide to like? What made you decide to take the full leap from leaving? Did you ever leave Raffles or? Tell me in. I'm uh, here. Well, I, I went to another place after I left the, you know, where you and I were in Western Sydney, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I moved to a private institute for about three years, I, which I headed the uh, visual communications there. Okay. And that was, and end, that ended in 06, and I got a studio for three months in China. It was actually funded by the Australia China Council. Sure. And those three months were, uh, well, they, I guess they were a life changer because even though I came back maybe once or twice that year and the following, largely that was be, to become my, in a sense, my primary studio and living place for the next 12 years. And really? The studio wow. still, yeah, the studio which I lease there is, uh, I've still got it and uh, I'll be going over there maybe uh, ne- next week. To uh, to determine whether we're going to proceed with things, because Beijing has changed like, so much, mean? even like, uh, Beijing's changed? this last year. Yeah, I've, I've been away for fifteen months, which is the longest stretch of time that I haven't been there. Yeah, uh, since the beginning. So, like, break it down. What's changed compared to someone who's never been to Beijing and only seen like Discovery documentaries? Like, what's like what's exactly changed? Like, what do you mean? Oh, well, that's it. just to give you a, in a nutshell, uh, let me see, where do I start? Well, I live in a complex of 105 studios. Holy shit. My, my, my studio and 105, which began mostly all artists. And now we have, uh, there's even a, a pizza restaurant and a noodle restaurant in there. So people have decided, you know, there's other things you can do, but there are, Set designers, fashion designers, novelists, you know, painters, and there's even a couple of interior designers, maybe even an architect. Sounds but uh, when, I, when I first moved in, which was uh, 2010, um, before that I was living just in in an apartment, you know, like mm-hmm. a bedsitter or a studio, yeah, or a studio apartment. And then a friend, actually a friend who's a painter. Uh, teaches uh, painting in Boston. Yeah. He has a studio in that same complex, and he said, do you want to take my studio for a year because I'm going away? You know, I said, okay, sure. And uh, after the year was over, I thought, gee, this is a far better way of doing things than uh, living in an apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I found found my own studio there. I spent a little bit of money putting, I put another mezzanine floor in. Oh, shit. And shit. rewired it and, you know, made it, like, comfortable. It's like like a like a good house now. I can I can sleep up to four people there, and it's about 172 square meters. Holy shit, you did it. Damn. It's big. It, it's big. But it's, you know, the rent's going up all the time, and Beijing is no longer cheap like it was. And my area, the area that the studio's in, now has become, you know, like everywhere else, you know, it doesn't matter in China or Australia or, or you, yeah, you know, it's like culture attracts, you know, yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now my, I have a friend who sublets my studio three months in the year. She's a Melbourne painter. And she told me the other day, one of the tenants drives a brand new Maserati. Holy shit. And... And and big Mercedes Benz and Audis like Audi eights and F five hundreds whatever. Yeah, there are uh, quite a few of those. Whereas when when I moved in, people were mostly on bicycles. Yeah, and, and on cars that were 
way below Ch Chinese cars. They were called Xiaolis. They were a little bit like, uh, I don't know if you remember, Hyundai XLs, mm -hmm. you know, the first mm -hmm. Hyundais. Yep, yep, yep. So they were budget cars. Um, so, But that's all replaced now. So the level of wealth has skyrocketed you know, in China. Well, since the since the manufacturing days, which they even yeah, that well, is uh, subcontracted to other countries now because it's cheaper to make it somewhere else. Well, because tariffs as of right now, you, you, you cannot that chump so, all those well, crazy tariffs on right now, as of today, on directly on China. What's tariffs? Sorry? Um, he put another tariff on China for all their goods. Oh, yeah, them. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. One more on the Well, north. yeah. Well, it's funny because I remember one year, it might have been quite a while back, maybe eight or nine years ago, I, I, I went on, on the plane and the magazine was a small ad in the corner so yeah. to uh, address to American, you know, American industrialists and designers yeah. and manufacturers. It says, "Come and produce in China. We we will we will handle it for you." And it's, it's, it says all, all these uh, points, you know. Mm. But but my assistant, I had an assistant there in China, and she helped me. I had a show in a uh, couple of shows in the U.S. One in Miami, and uh, I remember, and one in New York actually. And I asked her to come along because we're going to uh, translate text and stuff like that. But she's she's good That's around, amazing. you know just setting things up and video and everything else. I trained her from the start. Oh my God. So we were shopping one afternoon and she was looking for, I want stuff made in, in the US, you know. This yeah. was, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. 09 or 010, not that long ago. Yeah. And you know what? We, could, we couldn't find anything that was mm. made in the US. You know, not, well, like clothing. I think just for the test, we found three things made in the US. That's uh, Q-tips. Um, That's depressing. Like plastic uh, coat hangers. Oh. And I think and I think band aids, plaster band aids. Well, we're but you know we weren't. It things. wasn't exclude. You know we weren't looking that hard. It was just like let's go shopping. And, you know, whatever we can find. So even then it was already. You know, so the uh, well American market or man manufacturers were strongly uh, dependent on stuff being made in China. And of course, at that time, you know, people were saying stuff in China is inferior, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know? well, yeah. Yeah, but of course is, now... Um, true, yeah. It, it, all it's qualities not. are represented. Yeah, you know? yeah, because an iPhone will not last for a thousand years. It's, you know, it's... Well, the other thing I heard recently is that, and this, this may be a rumor, but I, I believe it, you know. Hit me. Is that Volvo was recently purchased by a guy in China who started his life fixing bicycles one at a time in the backyard. Really? Yeah, now someone can check whether that's true yeah, or not, yeah, but yeah. I see Vol yeah. Volvos yeah. around in here in Australia and in, in the US. In Australia I saw like a, uh, the whole thing, you know, the 90s and all that, and they obviously keeping the flag flying, you know, the yeah. branding, the quality, you know, Volvo, safe to safe cars, all that stuff. Well, yeah. none of that is, none of that uh, seems changed or compromised or just because, and I don't know for sure if it's where it's made, because it's a global market, you know, yeah, just yeah, because exactly it's owned right. by, by a guy in wherever it is, you know, it could be yeah. Mexico, China, it could be anywhere. The thing could be made in Czechoslovakia, it could be made in Philippines, Malaysia, anywhere, you know. You know, it's global. Yeah. yeah. So <coughs> that's it. So, um, so, 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 like, here's a bigger, ambiguous question for you, if I can. So, like, with you it, going from, say, say, China to Australia to America, especially to Miami and New York, York, such different cultures. I mean, in terms of your art, what is the art scene like in terms of a global? I mean, are they are they intermixing right now? Like, you know, if like like. Because I would expect if you were to, to to go to China, you would have a completely different art movement in there. Australia would be completely different, and then New York would have its own kind of own style and panage, and then Florida would be its own separate entity. I mean, how exactly? It's a broad question, but like, how do you work with it, and how do you like go through all those? Is it one thing? 
are we turning into one art thing, or is it separate and you're just... Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think I understand. Sorry. <laughs> really uh, where are you going with that? Did you bird your mouth? You know, it's, art, it's a, yeah. you know, I understand also it's a very complex question. Yeah, sorry. It, well, because, because you know, it's it, like, the like the global word applies no less to art because it's a, you know, it's like, like food, example, you know, yeah, fusion yeah. with uh, food without borders, you know. So mm -hmm. you use uh, three uh, ingredients usually restricted to Thai food, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you put it put it in with Scandinavian sausages or whatever, yeah. you know, exactly. Italian pasta, and you know the the, the modern day uh, chefs, uh, their vocabulary extends beyond borders, you know. So mm, that's it's, good point. unless you were going for something authentic, you, you might be going at I want a particularly Chinese authentic food like Sichuan noodles or whatever yeah. else. And then you you know you, you might actually uh, consider fusion, but if you want authentic, you're gonna go head straight to the place that's gonna give it to you. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that authenticity is a bit more difficult as a make in art, you know, yeah. uh, because everyone you know we're all informed by stuff, you know. Internet, yeah. Internet, internet and, and travels internet. much easier now, so it's it's much harder to keep. The authenticity uh, anchored, you know, yeah. doesn't matter what it is. And for example, I'm doing uh, the reason I'm in Vegas is because I initially was doing a project on souvenirs, souvenir designs. Uh -huh, I, I went, see. I went to Hawaii and I, I looked for. This was a project I was doing for a thesis, you know, at yeah. the time. Yeah. I looked That's for awesome. souvenirs in Hawaii that were distinct, you know, special. Couldn't find any. I, I could find some carved coconut heads, you know. Yeah. And but mostly it's plastic combs with Waikiki written on it, you know. Like it could be Vanuatu or yeah, uh, Versailles for that matter, you know. Yeah. And so the only thing I took away from there that I considered as something special to take away from a particular place were actually tin toys, science science fiction toys, and they were actually made in China. But I haven't seen them anywhere else. What? Like there were a lot of them there. They, they either imported a whole bunch and uh, it was easier to get there than anywhere else, but it certainly doesn't represent Hawaii, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course. I actually gave a talk about the subject. Uh, it's crazy. And it was, the subject was called Mass Customization of our Cultural Identity. In other words, yep. how do we man manufacture a lot of stuff that is special to the place we come from or that, you know? Yeah. Or when you visit somewhere, you want something special from there to remember it by, right? Exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave a talk, and I think the talk was in Montreal, and the woman sitting next to me, she was the professor, English professor at UNLV in Vegas. Okay. You know? And then she she was uh, interested in what I had to say and said, have you been to Vegas? I said, not really. I've seen movies, blah, 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 yeah. but I've never set foot in a place. Well, she said, why don't you come, in, come by and... Uh, I'll show you around on the way out, you know. So we did. I, that was 1995. Oh, shit. So I, and I walked into the place and I was flabbergasted, you know, like, like, like a mean? big walk-in walk -in snow globe, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it took two years before I decided to get the souvenirs. I'll do something based on Vegas. So I used Vegas as my primary uh, research site. Yeah. And... and um, Eventually, the, the thesis was called the architecture of risk, you know, okay. which means the whole physiology of not just gambling, but the whole industry, you know, people moving. So the thing was considering what risk was in, in our uh, domain, you know, yeah. in our behavior, in our in human human endeavors. What 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 is risk? What is a gamble? You know, okay. so. Yeah. That in itself was interesting because if you, you know, compare it to the Neanderthal man, the, you know, when we're hunters and gatherers, yeah. you, would have, you would have to take a risk and go over those mountains and by the river and everything where the deer were found. You know, they had yeah. a lot more meat. There was a lot more food. Yeah. And, but you have to risk your life getting there. You might yeah. get eaten by something or another tribe might get you, whatever, you yeah. know. But Cougars, so, tigers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At that time, you have to you have to make that gamble, you know. 
which is very much the same nowadays, you know, but except we don't hunt, hunt and gather anymore. We even go to supermarkets, you know. Mm. So we have to now gamble on whether to buy brand X or brand Y. Maybe one has more plastic in it, the other one has not, or you want to encourage less plastic use with brand X and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you so know. Wait, 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 wait. You're saying that the whole um, fight or flight, the whole us kind of occupying our time, um, well, I mean, because isn't that what, like, Neanderthals did all day long, is is they just hunted the land all day, and that's where we get the hunter, woman's days of home. I mean, are you saying that yeah, they're just I mean, filling the plate? Well, let's face it, you know, we, we have very similar lives everywhere, you know? Yeah. The, the, the supermarkets, the online stuff, the books we read, uh, internet, newspapers, media, whatever, social media. Uh, iPhones especially, you know, everywhere it's the fucking same, you know. You're right, you're right. Because, oh my God, you're right. So, so <laughs> hence, all, design is similar. I'm, I'm, I'm leading to yeah. your question about art, but design is very similar. Like nowadays, I, I saw in the US, you know, uh, I think the, one of the first things of late that I saw interesting as far as American automobile design okay. was the, say, Impala, Chevy Impala, and maybe, of course, the Lincolns, you know, Lincolns. So, basically, automobile design used to be very distinct, you know. I, mm. I, I put a picture on Instagram of a 1957 Borgward Isabella, which was a coupe, you know, as a pre... But Isabella uh, Borgward became... Um, a good brand for air conditioners and gearboxes later and worked wow. with Mercedes and stuff wow. like that, yeah. right? But in 57, the design was absolutely unique, you know? There was nothing about that car that looked like any other car, you know? Even uh, the two-door coupe variation was very differently solved as another car would be, you know? Yeah. So, but, and then I remember a friend of mine put a something on Facebook and he put a picture of a 57 Bel Air, maybe, Chevy, and put next to it a picture of a modern-day car, say, doesn't matter, a Camry, say, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he was he was disgusted with the the drop in individuality between necks, you know? Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Well, eh? that's globalism. The thing is, yeah. I noticed lately true. that uh, the first thing is that computer design, 3D computer design enables you know, the fabrication, the shaping of metal and plastic and whatever else, now it's completely malleable. You know, you can make a, a curve. Yeah, it's in my point. Change, yeah, change from plastic to metal to glass to something else, you know, and the, the line would be deadly accurate, you know, within a micromillimeter, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, the so printing alone has changed things. Yeah, so, yeah. industrially we, we're, we're truly capable. We can make anything... Uh, we can make it as fancy as we like, but the limitation is people's taste. You know, yeah. If you yeah. Make, if you make a car that looks we a, a lot different, it might be seen as weird. You know, that's true, eh? That's very true. Or stolen. Yeah. Don't so, forget. Or so stolen. if you want if you want to be a top seller, you got to stay with a bunch. You know, if mm -hmm. if Camry sells X million cars and you want to sell as many as them, well, you can't do it too differently. Not immediately. Maybe as an evolution, you could, you know, train your marketplace to think differently that your brand actually has more well, to offer in design endeavor, yeah. than a Camry. Yeah? yeah. But initially, that first model, like now, I see a lot more Chinese brands coming out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, taking over. well, they're also. And you look at, say, for instance, the Korean car. You know, which offered the seven years warranty. You know. Ooh. And that's in Australia. I know. I noticed yeah. in the US they're offering ten now, ten years. Really, I did not know that. Holy shit! Yeah, man. So the thing is, this company making any cash? Uh, anyone's anyone selling it for three years, or like VW or Big B, doesn't matter what brand. People will say, "What's the what's the matter with your car? You can offer, only offer three years." You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, it's an eco economic thing, you know, the engineers have to figure out how can we make this work, you know, seven years is a lot, long time for a car to have to stay together, you know. Yeah, it is, yeah. So, but that's the exchange, that someone's opened up that game, like Hyundai, Kia, the uh, Korean makers, 
and now everyone has to follow if they want to, you know, they, they won't sell cars. This is the new pattern, if you like, the new norm, you know? Yes. So if you lose money by servicing the seven years, you'll have to make it up somewhere else, yeah, maybe exactly. in sales or whatever, you know? Yeah. I so mean, that's the, the global thing now is uh, that is one thing. Now we go back to art, you know, China went through a stage where they were completely isolated, you know, mm. and I was there in the late 80s and I went to Guangzhou of Canton, which is on the south of China, and there wasn't really much uh, contemporary art, you know, and over the year or two following, they started to learn about Western art, you know, Andy Warhol, all that stuff, you know, Impressionism, and caused the whole of Chinese uh, art education had to go through Western stuff, you know, mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose in order to successfully interchange with the West. But that came sort of, and in 1985, uh, there's a, a Chinese guy, a cu famous curator, his name is Li Xianting. He curated a big show at M MoMA, New York, you know, it's called, uh, I think it was called Malgo's Pop, I think it was, I see. that was the name of it, 1985. So yeah. it, it, he put together all these contemporary artists from China and it was on show at MoMA, you know. From that moment on, uh, that was the awakening. And since then, there have been huge collectors of art that, that have shifted to collecting Chinese art because it became intriguing, you know, the change. There was another, suddenly another player in the world, mm. a serious player with many players that had something else to say. You know, so so people gravitated more toward like you mean like the the classical like Chinese. No, art. no, no. Like there was another contemporary art. You know where, like I think, uh, like now I I'm, I'm not sure where we stand. But for example, yeah, Ai Weiwei, the art Chinese artist. I think he's top top five or top top ten, depending on where you look. Sure. Yeah. But you know, but although he's Chinese Chinese contemporary. Basically, the measuring stick for any of those ratings is worldwide, you know, like mm, okay. an artist from you. and other artists from elsewhere, you know, from Africa, from Istanbul, from anywhere could can qualify. And it's an interesting game because I, I suppose usually it's measured by sales, maybe auction sales, you know, you know, all that sort of stuff and num number of. You know, the, the usual career measurements, number of museums collected, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So there was a time when Chinese art started to grow beyond being derivative of West and American and European art, mm. you know. I mean, okay. there's a lot of it still around everywhere. It's no less influenced by Impressionism, by Picasso, by even Jeff Koons, than anywhere else, you know? So it's, they're still kind of meshing things together as well, like everyone else. Well, let's put it this way. The information is just as available to artists in China as it is anywhere. Oh, yeah. I see That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, and then it's the concern, next concern is how Chinese ought, ought this be, you know, like um, a lot of my work in the last 10 years is because I'm, Chinese by heritage, you know, I see. but uh, it's kind of hard to track because uh, anything Chinese out of me is my great grandfather who came from Fujian, you know, which is the south of China, okay. and he migrated to Indonesia, which was under Dutch rule, Dutch East Indies, back in the 1800s. I you didn't know, know that. And, and it, it's a great place, you know. I think Fujian was suffering a little bit of. Uh, a famine, you know, it was a, a difficult place. So, uh, like, that's what immigration is. People choose to live where they prefer to look for somewhere else. Exactly they prefer right. to live, you know. Yeah, it makes them happier and they can live a better life, yeah. Yeah, look for more sunshine or nearer the water or I like I like more fish than beef, you know, yeah. or maybe the Nirvana. women are more beautiful, whatever. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Colorado, no. <laughs> um, as it turns out, the last, uh, the next generations after my great grandfather, yeah, they all stayed in Singapore, in Indonesia. My mum and dad, 
uh, both independently, or bo <laughs> independently, yeah. both born in Surabaya, Indonesia, and then we left in the '59 when Sukarno came into rule as a president, Who's and Sukarno? the country. Okay. Oh, Sukarno right. was the pre the incoming president at the time, and yeah. he made Indonesia uh, a national country. You know, they wanted to, he wanted a national identity. And uh, one of the problems is that uh, for people of uh, Chinese heritage, were, I think, were given, uh, were restricted because uh, it didn't fit in with the, you know, oh, national, yeah. uh, national call. Crazy, crazy. So um, that made us leave. Wow. So we went crazy. to Singapore and then eventually to Australia. I came to Australia when I was age 12, and really my whole education has been since age 12. You know? Just like but, me as well, too, yeah. I came to Australia, well, I mean, I moved to Australia when I was 12, so yeah. Oh, well, there you go, yeah, yeah, I know. bingo. And you know, so <laughs> did Mel Gibson as well, too. So just don't We'll have a three-way conversation next, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, yeah. So, 12, yeah. so I went to school, primary school, he went to university here, I managed to drop out of an economics course. Oh my God, unbelievable. In the late 60s, because, I'll tell you why, because why? Uh, at the time, I did pure maths, you know, which I still use now, intrigues me, I think pure maths, I first found sculpture in pure maths, in, uh, really? you can get a formula in, inversion to, to invert a sculpture, you know, and that was the first time I actually yeah. envisaged form, but through figures, you know, through a formula. I get you. Wow, that's a crazy way to go. Right. Holy shit. Well, which is, you know, that's the uh, that's the thing with computers now. It's all it's all maths and programming. You know, that's true. That's very the, true. The pictures, the pictures you see, whether it's Illustrator or or three D or whatever, it's, it's all basically, you know. Numbers in architecture, you know, uh, behind everything. So that, uh, that was the first time I uh, I encountered it, you know. But I had to do accountancy as well for this uh, in the course, and they wouldn't let me change. So <laughs> accountancy. I failed accountancy two really? years running, <laughs> and I actually got for the same exam. I got one percent less in the second year oh, than wow. I did the first. That's crazy. It's crazy. So that's how. Uh, I mean, if you're talking left right, left brain and right brain, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, might, it, it could very well be one of those. I remember putting my hand up when it came to double entry, you know. Yeah. I think the professor must have got sick of me, you know. Gee, not him again. Yeah. No. And so, actually, I, I dropped out of that, and I didn't go back to study really? until until I was 25. So that would have been six, six years, maybe late. seven years well, later. 25 is pretty I was, late. I mean, yeah. So, 25. Uh, I mean, in my teaching days, now, I mean, people come to art schools or any course, yeah. even later, even later, even in their 50s and stuff, yeah. you know, which is great, you know, that you can do that, actually rediscover yourself, reinvent yourself mm, at a... Yeah. Even late in life, I mean, fifty is not really late. Half halfway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. So, so uh, art didn't come about till I was, you know, basically when I was twenty eight, twenty nine. That's when I felt, you know, I became a, a practitioner. So uh, it time, came too. very late, and uh, Nine, the Chinese years? background, the heritage made me uh, interested primarily in uh, in clay in, in pottery because I was looking at the uh, oriental ceramics for example as a you know as a means to I suppose I felt something I innate you know that there's something mm. Chinese in me but I, I couldn't get a make on it you know I, I read <laughs> somewhere or it's, it's, it's comes to but give me a break where, where is it you know yeah, how yeah, to yeah, get it out yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sort of very uh, simple uh, um, explorations with the calligraphic brush, you know, like, uh, uh, even though I, I didn't write the Chinese calligraphy, but the brush oh, yeah, lends yeah, yeah. itself to some sort of flow, you know. Mm -hmm. Same with the clay. Uh, with, I made ceramic. Stuff, right? I, I worked in ceramics for 
uh, 15, 17 years. That's a long time. Seriously, you know, uh, yeah, I worked as a uh, as a potter, so I made really? no the shit. usual a dozen casseroles, you know, and lidded pots and try to sell it as uh, as a living. So I uh, built kilns. The whole the whole science of ceramics intrigued me, you know. Yeah. And and the way the way the the, the glazes come on and the brushes and design whether well, it had symmetry or two or three handles, blah, blah, blah. But but all these aspects, I think, in the back of my mind, are still here, you know? Yeah. Because we we uh, differentiate between cultures. Not We don't do it very well, you know? I mean, mm. what, what makes a, a piece of art look uh, French or, uh, you know, Hawaiian or whatever? Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a very nebulous... Uh, uh, unless you study the thing from a psychological and, you know, you have a strong uh, lineage of art history that you can argue a point that this is based on Pizarro and therefore the blah, 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 you know. Yeah. But overall, you and I and the general public would find it very difficult to say, oh, that sometimes, you know, I mean, in, when we mention Chinese contemporary art, see, the thing is in China... Beijing in particular, with the place I know quite well, there are so many artists, you know, that, and uh, I'll just go back to my studio, for example. Yeah. The studios were built on land that was really... Uh, like farming kind of for stuff? For agri it was farming yeah. land, you know. Yeah. It was meant to be allotted to people who had uh, wanted to grow something. But these entrepreneurs started building these um, brick structures and found that artists were uh, renting more than uh, farmers were. And at one stage, oh, wow. I think it was 2007, 2008, I researched in Beijing how many of these studios were around. I didn't get around. Beijing's huge, you know. Oh, but yeah. I, I did, a, I, did a, I spent uh, weeks on it and I found 23 art studios of at least uh, 40 or 50 studios per, you know, each one of them yeah, yeah. per zoning to a very large one up to 400. They were huge. And it made me realize that, yeah. where the profession of artists, how they're considered in uh, in China, in Beijing in particular. Yeah. So, and, like, and, and when you look around, some of them had day jobs and some of them were teaching, you know, but quite a lot did, just did art, you know, they, they uh, whatever they did, uh, their income was nowhere else but from art, you know, were now I'm not saying... Or like, were they just that, doing okay at that time, or like, what was... Well, you know, they were surviving, you know, they were surviving, okay. they, didn't, they, 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 they didn't look poorer than anybody else. Interesting. Um, so, so the art you know, maybe they were on bicycles rather than cars, that sort yeah. of thing, but you know... The only place on earth that I have ex witnessed where artists were um, rega well regarded as, as citizens, as yeah. professionals, where? was in Paris. In mm -hmm. Paris, they built artist studios, <coughs> a bit like we have here, uh, Housing Commission, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think that's in the U.S. as well. So these houses were built to, they were built, purpose-built to help people that were struggling, either, yeah. you know, people that uh, either had some disability or uh, they were disadvantaged socially in some way or another and, mm. and governments see the need that they need, you know, support. And in Paris that support was directed towards artists, you know, they weren't, wow. uh, they, yeah, they weren't disadvantaged totally socially or anything mentality. else, but they just had a different sort of profession. They, you know, they lived mm -hmm. differently. And in Paris, it was recognized that, um, you know, that some tax money was uh, diverted to help artists, uh, you know, survive. Dear God, what if we did that here in America and Australia, my God, like, I wonder how much culture would be, like, revived, and speaking of, so, oh, I'm gonna give it a quick clap, just for thinking, sweet, um, 
So like, the, like, okay, here's the, the biggest thing is like, you know, in Australia, the biggest problem I had, like, you know, I was 10 years, a freelance DOP cinematographer and, you right. know, uh, it was great. But the problem was like, well, there was a few problems is that number one, it seemed like nobody wanted us to join films. Like, you know, everybody works hard. There's money and there's, uh, there's donations, the government's putting out risk, which goes up, up and up. And then. Apart from the initial screening, the cinemas are dead. Because, let's face it, if you have a choice between Samson and Delilah or Transformers 5, your friends are going to say, let's grab a beer and see Transformers 5. So I found it to be kind of like, like when I was doing it, kind of like a way to preserve the culture in like a really crazy way. Like, the more Mm -hmm. Aussie films we shot, and like, I had a guest on my podcast the other day, Sultan, who was talking about, about... very passionate about how yeah, you know all Australian stories have been told in terms of on film and on camera. I'm, I mean, do you think that that's true? And do you think that we, we are culturally dead in terms of cinema? And and of course, if we're dead in cinema, that means it would of course flow into art, right? I mean, because if you're huh. only doing three films a year, and the government's only putting three million into each one, but you're giving sixteen million to the Great Gatsby Universal production, I mean, like, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ambiguous again here, sorry. Yeah, like, uh, how do you no, feel no, about, No, but like, I see where you're getting at. Like, but is it about preservation, is, uh, or is it about actually uh, creating a product, it feels like? Well, the two sides of what you're saying is the culture getting saturated, as in we can't talk about anything else now anymore about our culture, uh, that's easily differentiated from other movies or other cultures, that's you know, true. so how, how is an Australian film released in Paris, how is it going to stand out compared to other true. French films or, yeah. or other films from any other country, you yeah. know, that sort of, are we talking about that sort of culture, which is again, a fact of globalism, but then the other thing is like, uh, the the power of invention, you know, the power of uh, uh Creating a, a new vision, you know, uh, that can that can come from doesn't necessarily come from a culture A or culture B. It's like the effect of your environment, you know, economic whatever. Yeah, uh, produces in an individual that somehow you know, like uh, compared to music, you know. Yeah, there's so much music being produced now. I can talk a bit more about music because actually. I work in, in music as well. Oh, yeah? So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> just by the way, just as a background, when I was going to art school, the thing, I only recently found myself saying this, my first professional source of income was, in fact, from music. Oh, shit. I, I played in a band, in the same band for five years, and that supported my first wife, my then wife and daughter. Yeah. I... Um, paid my mortgage from that, and I even renovated the house with it, and I got beat through art school, you know. Why don't you, so, holy shit, so you're saying you could have gone on and just been like, I could have, you you could right now be continuing that kind of pathway. I mean, because that would be crazy. I guess, well, yeah, simply put, yes, but the thing, the funny thing is, Daniel, that's the same thing, like, you know, we're talking about your podcast here, and so much uh, information is coming across. Uh, uh, if, if you watch Instagram, there are literally thousands of guitarists now. Oh yeah, that's you true. Know, right. yeah. That, that that can play uh, from a Hendrix school or from uh, well, it doesn't matter, you know. It's saturated. Uh, what's yeah. his name? Benz- any Benzinier or jazz school, whatever, you know. People have got that information, and if they're disciplined and they get it right, uh, you know, that's why in Instagram there are thousands of really great virtuoso musicians, I think more so probably than ever in history, you know, really? and does not not just get, guitar is probably obvious because it's a popular culture yeah. icon, you know, yeah. um, and, uh, and uh, there's of course uh, DJing and synthesizers and keyboard and, uh, and more electronic stuff. Which is also equally, uh, you know, we're swimming in the stuff. You know, it's yeah, everywhere. It's true. It's uh, true. You look at Spotify, all these digital means of uh, distribution yeah. of this music form. 
like there's a lot of bands, you know, that and there's fractional influence, this, that, the other. That. It's it's like uh, it's e almost easy to find if you went to you like a certain you know genre of music, whether it's uh, you know. Well, it doesn't matter what form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just so much of it, you know. So that makes it more difficult, I suppose. To uh, that's the medium we we have, you know, with the iPhones and computers and stuff. So it's uh, completely open, you know, and anyone can can join, you know. Like I bought my grandson a uh, secondhand Yamaha keyboard, so, nice. you know. Nice. And, well, you know, when you look at the I look at Craigslist and Facebook, and the oh, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. Selling, people selling these things, like a lot of them, you know, e either they don't get used and they sell them for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or stuff like that. Mm. And and there's so many, you know, if you look at what Casio and Yamaha produce over the decades, there's, they make a different one every year or just about, you know, That's a, very true. A, yeah. a different feature or it's a little bit cheaper or it's a little bit. So. It's all out there. It's not expensive, and, and you know, all, all you need, like all these virtuosos you see now, classical music. Most of them uh, get their training at a young age. You know, like they, when, as soon as they can walk, they, if they, especially if they have an environment like their parents play or yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And so uh, I've met a few people. Like yeah, that. So, yeah. So that uh, I don't know what, what, how we got to talking. Yeah, about that. You, no, 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 you're fine. Um, in terms of like you know, during the film. Australian, oh, Australian where is culture, it going, right, and, uh, right. and is Australian film dead in the, the water as well? Well, the thing is, here's what I think. That's why we have your, uh, uh, you know, here we have Australia Council and, and grant funding stuff. Yeah. And the uh, yeah, National Endowment over there, and the, probably Canada's doing really well with, you know, supporting their up-and-coming yeah, talent. a lot of new films out. Yeah. yeah they're doing great. Yeah, so uh, basically... The people that uh, decide on who gets money for development, hopefully, are people that can uh, determine exactly what you say. You know what what the country, how the country should support uh, new ideas. You know that well. That could come from young people. Well, doesn't matter where it comes from. You know. Yeah. But as as long as long as there's a system that upholds and supports, you know, up up and coming stuff. You know and Obviously, in Australia, well, we you know we support uh, Australian uh, new ideas, and yes. uh, and in the U.S. the same goes over there. But and the interesting thing is when the culture, when you're talking about culture, given that we're influenced by so much global, in, you know, global stuff, yeah, is that um, like we're talking about fusion, and everything else. So everything has fused together, you know. So it becomes more difficult to uh, find original. Uh, yeah. You know, actually, just for an aside, yeah. I've been following the history of ABBA. You know. Oh yeah, it's really? really? No, it's changing. Really? Good. What made you decide to go into the, to think about that? I, I, I can't remember what exactly it was. We, you, know, going, right? you know, yeah, we, we have different things. <laughs> like it might have been the Beatles hey, one hey, stage, hey. stage or enough. Pink Fair Floyd enough. another time, no problems. No problems. or. Uh, Ab Ab Ron Rhinoceros or Steve Miller Band, whatever. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, but Abba, on, on this occasion, what happened? They won the uh, Eurovision contest with that song Waterloo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then nothing else. It's you know the trouble with Eurovision, mostly in, t in terms of popular culture, apart from w winning it, most people think it's a one-hit wonder. You know, nothing else happens. Mm. And it's funny that Abba actually released some songs in Australia and uh, the Australian TV countdown and everything picked up on one or two songs and from there it became world famous you know Ooh. if Australia hadn't picked it up you, it really? would have been it would have just sunk you know you think but it's all so due they, to Australia picking up Abba's love well it could have been it could have been Kenya it could have been anywhere Sweden as anywhere, long as one you know? country as a whole went holy shit yes so, something like that, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, that's crazy. Um, I think ABBA had something like a five or six year stint where they were, you know, just producing uh, hit after hit. Yeah. And now they're ingrained, you know. They're, yeah. They're now the musicals about you know, them, conscious, yeah. yeah. And our conscious histories, you know. And in fact, uh, I was reading the uh, 
interview that Agnika, the the blonde that was in uh, ABBA, yeah. she is sort of making another bit to it. She was she was saturated from what I re read after the '79 or something like that World Tour. She was just saturated. You know, she couldn't cope with it. You know, it was just too much of the yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Fame, <laughs> fame and you know, pressure. So she just gave it up completely. And I think uh, I think she, three decades later she decides, oh, I think I can do something, you know. But uh, of course, it's not Abba, and it's uh, although she's famous for having the things she's done, you know, she's mm. got a a big um, history. Um, it's difficult for her now to find a, an avenue where she is uh, easily distinguished as a as a you know artist you know yeah but she's work, working on it you know so Can't escape that's water probably water. the same with anything like you know um whether it's architecture architects that, that have famous buildings at once upon a time and then you know things change uh so but the reason I brought up ABBA is that they're from Sweden, and when you, you know, when, when they have their interviews, their their English is not that fluent, you know. Is a really uh, oh, shit. Oh well, they could speak English, but yeah, you know, yeah. they, they were. But when you listen to the music, the lyrics, it flows, you know, like it actually the the idiomatic sense of English, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and if you listen to some lyrics, they're actually quite clever, you know. They are. I mean, there's a poetic. Um, structure to how things are put, you know, whether you're in love or you're brokenhearted or whatever. It's, there's a there's a certain way that lyrically you can put things together that musically gel, you know. And the, in the English language and in pop music, English is still the the major. You know, if you want to have a international pop song, very ra rarely is it French or Russian or anything it's else. Like it has about to be lot, in English, yeah. you know. Because that was the original mode of our, uh, you know, recording music, radio, uh, the way it's the stuff is distributed, you know. So that's all the history. So same with art, I think, you know. We we had the American, Euro-American system back in the, we are talking about modernism earlier. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that was defined by the machinery that was... Uh, born in the US or in Europe, you know, so if any other culture or member of any other culture wants to get in on the on the game, they have to abide by the game that's been already set up by oh, America yeah, or Europe, you know, Whatever. so, and now, of course, uh, it's expanding, so, you know, an African or Japanese or... Anyone can take it out either. now, yeah. Icelandic, you know, they can all fit in because the language, the language used in contemporary art is, has that global stretch. And so the trick is to uh, to not succumb totally to it, but keep some heritage yeah. in there, you know. As, yeah, so ABBA, say, for example, if you listen to it, because it's so ingrained in our popular culture, yeah. it's very difficult to, because... Apart from the fact that we know they're from Sweden, mm -hmm. it's very hard to distinguish that as being a part of Swedish culture. You Same. know, I I always thought that they were Australian. I'll be honest. I literally until you <laughs> told me that, I legitimately always would have been like, they lived in the outback, they died there. That's I, you know, I would have assumed that. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So, for example, uh, one of the bands that do extremely well now, the Killers, you know, from oh, yeah, Las the Vegas. Killers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's uh, when you come to Vegas. There's a lot of bands there. You know, they're oh, all yes. trying to do this and that. But the Killers just separated themselves. I mean, obviously, a very special kind of uh, mix of uh, <laughs> yeah. musical um, yeah. elements in what they do. You know, oh, which yeah. uh, and of course luck. You know, there's a lot, lot of luck. I mean, like. Um, how many artists do we know that are really great, but they're having they're having trouble getting it's true. It's true. airplay? You know. Yes, yes, yes. There's a lot of them now. Yeah, I feel like being phased about all the oldies as well, like all the classic the, the nineties that are hanging out are still kind of like slowly fading away. Yeah, uh, you know, like uh, I look at something like 
all the giants like uh, you watch uh, Roger Waters or Pink Floyd on TV, mm. and because it's so ingrained with people, you know, the audience just you know they know every every piece of that music, you know. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. They can sing it backwards almost. It's part but of the culture now, yeah. Pay, pay big money to see the original members play yeah. the thing, you know. And uh, I remember uh, talking about Australian bands. There's a there's a little river band in, in va playing around in the US. No shit. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> but it doesn't have any of the original members in there. I think uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, it's the same band, what? kind of. <laughs> The same Which band? one? Is the same band though? It's 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 like the same type. No, type well, the same the same, they, they you know it's Barker. They deliver. They only play what people know. Yeah, but the none of the original members are in there anymore. You know, so um, <laughs> We're gonna I keep mean that's going. the. Well, I remember if, if you use that example, it's like have you seen the uh, what's that movie about McDonald's founder? The founder, oh, the founder, with, yeah, uh, Michael Keaton, great. Film. Michael Keaton uh, starts yeah. off as a great, lovable. A uh, character who's just really trying to get through with hard times, and then of course it turns mm -hmm. out he's very smart and selfish and greedy, and uh, but also a pioneer at the same the same way. And also you you got to hand it to him for being so smart and clever. But yes, he did screw everyone he knew over and played a sly game. But yeah. so there's both well, good and bad. Well, well, um, it's all bad except for business admiration. I would say, yeah. Well, I wonder, you know, that sort of, um, that, that's, I suppose you could label that somewhere around the word corruption, you know. Mm, yes. um, so the or original McDonald brothers were completely cut out of the game, you know. Crazy, at one, you know they, if they wanted to start another business, franchise, restaurant, they couldn't call it McDonald's anymore, you know. The, um, a lot of that's happening, you know, like the, the, the buying up. I mean, the other day I was watching about Facebook and the privacy issue, you know. Cambridge Analytica so, and all that, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's getting so complex and so, you know, um, well, you know, I, I'm not sure if, yeah, but it's, it's all to do with corruption. Yeah, because I was going to say, that is 100% you know, corruption. It's money, money, and, money and rights and, and again, you know, um, Borders are blurred, uh, privacy, um, ownership's blurred, um, good and bad is blurred, you yeah. know. Yeah. So uh, not only culture, not only you're saying like uh, the identity component of cultures going down, which I suppose you, you've got to say it's got, it's got to, you know, because the more, um, I mean, if you go to China, for instance, everyone's got iPhones. Now, the yeah. interesting thing is <laughs> iPhones in China, there are, Every time I go over there, there are six or seven brands of iPhones, more or less copies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're much cheaper, and to some extent, they're, they're improved models, you know, oh, just God. by <laughs> doing the same function cheaper is, in a sense, an improvement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I remember my iPhone, which is a 6S Plus, I think. Yeah. In the old days, when the battery's gone, you had to throw the phone yes. out, you know, basically. There's too complicated a, to change, or, or the glass, or whatever. There, yeah. mm. But now, on YouTube, it shows how to replace your own battery, and you can buy the battery and the little kit. Yeah. Does It's no, no big deal, you know? Uh, and so that's the new... Uh, and I, I knew a, one of my students worked for this Chinese company, which was essentially uh, a technology company, and yeah. they copied stuff, you know? But... Eventually, um, the word copy seemed not to be relevant anymore. Like it was like reverse the, engineering kind of stuff. Like yeah, just, development. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you get development, you get yeah, phone or some some yeah. technology piece. R and D. Yeah, let's absolutely. pull it apart. Let's pull it apart and see how it can be improved. What's mm. what's wrong with this? And you know, and so that's basically what they did. You know, they they pulled something new apart and see if they can solve the problem that wasn't already solved. Mm. You know. So like, so like you brought up a really cool point before, before we turned on the cameras. Um, like, where do you think in terms of the culture now, in terms of like the world stage and what's going on with the whole politics and how crazy things are and in terms of the, the news and oversaturation, how do you think that is influencing art right now? Because you were, you brought that, that up and that's a really great 
question because right now we're at a like America's at a crossroads and the country it's very divided like you know and every other country is kind of it seems like everything's going crazy like how is that influencing like how are we going to remember this when when we look back at art are we going to be joyful or are we going to be like holy shit like like how do you think it's impacting it it's difficult, isn't it? Because uh, it's, it, it'd be different if every, everybody said together, wow, you know, we've done this component that we've done for the last five decades seems to be grinding to a halt, you know? Mm. So let's have a community think tank and see yeah. do we need to throw it out and put something else in there or how can we fix it or yeah. stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And the trouble is that... Uh, in a society that feels it's still comfortable with how things are, you know, ah, and you yeah. and also really unable to distinguish what needs to be disconnected and what needs to be, you know, Ooh, you're renewed. Bringing it down. You're bringing it down it, to the hardcore shit here. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's, been, it's difficult, like, it's difficult for everybody, you know, like China's changing quickly, everyone, play, I think Australia is sort of, always been uh, an isolated country away from everywhere else mm. but it, it's been as you know using America as a as a sort of a model really of you know social financial economic manufacturing everything everything else and America's Australia's at one point I think maybe still called the 52nd state oh you know? hey, uh, hey. <laughs> yeah but, it's a hard uh, truth it's a hard truth though you're right, though. But you know, you're right. In what I what I really enjoy about Australia is the nice. still available uh, free press, you know, like the SBS TV. That's true. And oh, ABC News and there. ABC, like the news, there are still uh, uh, recognizable bodies that uh, search out the truth. You know, yeah, search out a, a, a true analysis of of the situation. Which is harder to find, well, hard to find in China because everything is there uh, controlled by the government, you know, and it's, it's uh, censored. And uh, in a way, it's a bit better in, in, in the States, but uh, it too is uh, tempered by not only the government, but I think by uh, the common... Uh, how how people feel about what's being said about the country, you know, like uh, yeah. So there's a nationalism that I think uh, is hard anywhere, but in the states I'm thinking in particular hard to kind of uh, adjust. You yes. Know, adjust yeah. It. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. It, it's like a you know once you spill a whole lot of beans out of a bucket, mm. you can't pull the bucket back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, let's not spill so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Big, yeah. the beans are just storming out there and all people can do is say, wow, look, look, look at those beans go. That's a great you know? cultural example, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I spend a lot of time in, in the U.S. I live there and work there part of the year. And... And I know, you know, my friends, my these people I associate with, they're all expressed like anywhere else on the globe. You know, we're all concerned what's happening with the planet. Yes, right? yes, yes. That, oh, yeah. That, that, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be uh, curtailed. You know, mm. the, it's just bad, lots of bad habits. You know, and, yeah. and corporations are, are too committed now to, you know, like the the the. the, the I think slowly we might see the. Uh, uh, energy thing, energy use, the coal and the, ga and the gas, that that might eventually go, but because we have to, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, we have it's to, a yeah. pre no pre choice. precarious balance, and the you know the plastic being being um, wasted and stuff, and you know, like every time I go on a plane, I can't believe how much plastic, you know, yeah. you have one cup of water, it's and then when you get another, thing, the next yeah. bit of water comes in a different cup, yeah. you know. And it's almost impossible to keep deep, keep the first piece of cup. And there's like what 500 passengers in a in a plane. It's 500 cups. And mm -hmm. they get a, a new cup every two hours. That's how many yeah. hours? You know, a 15 hour flight. That's yeah. a lot of plastic you cups. Waste things. Our society waste things. Yeah. So 
that, that, that that's a perfect example. You know, whether we can actually how how quickly we can curb these bad habits. And not that's just not, plastics is probably one of the worst examples. Uh, you know, extinction of animals, uh, ruin yeah. ruination of uh, habitats. Yeah, all yeah. that all that stuff, and then. Uh, so I think the bottom line is the what you were saying before about culture, you know, I think the arts, uh, the voice of concern sometimes is actually best portrayed by, right. you know, film, yeah. uh, art, and it's, it's the, only, the only place that's still, I mean, I mean, a lot of governments try and censor art, yeah. you know. But still, it's the spirit, of, yeah, spirit of us, you know, the human being, that's still able to say something. You know, while well, we can say something, you know, and some some things we are, you know, completely cut off from what is right and what's what we know to be right or wrong. You know, we just ourselves we're so to totally uh, drowned by uh, by habit and you know, by habit and. Uh, history, you know, that, that we're unable to think anymore about how to stop our uh, it's a decline, you know, yeah. we, like um, everything is like it's we had it so good, yeah, and oh, now right. I know, all right, you know, and, right, that. and so now we don't have the tools yeah. to to actually uh, limit, you know, this so-called goodness. This, well, we no. do have their tools. That's the whole crazy thing about the world is that we have all the, the potential to fix all the problems, but we don't. And, you know, we talk about democracy, of course, which yeah. is one of the, uh, uh, you know, basic tools, you know, yeah. that uh, individuals get a say about what happens, you know. Yeah, it's... But, you know, and then the, the, we go back to the Facebook privacy and yeah. stuff, you know, and then... Uh, so you and I are being brainwashed, you know, every time we pick something up, the phone or something, there's some little thing that people have worked out about yours and how you and I mm. think or what we're going to do tomorrow, that even that small element that we're going to, you know, follow, uh, you know, maybe we're uh, unconsciously following something that someone has actually preordained, pre you know, for us. So subconsciously, we are actually losing territory all along the way just by succumbing to things like social media and, and the internet and stuff, you know. Mm. So culture, yes, culture loss, identity loss, it's all over the place. Every, we're losing everything. We're losing everything surely but surely a piece at a time. And it's slipping away like very quickly, you know. So... Uh, Yes, we are losing stuff, but yes, we have to do something about it, you know. Like, what um, can we do? Like, do you mean, like, you know, archives and more museums and preservation projects, do you mean? Or do you mean just more just, like... Well, it's, it's such a know. complex animal, so, yeah, you sorry. know. Um, sorry. <laughs> for me, um, a lot of my work that I did uh, in China back in '09, I'm I'm still... Well, I'm still working on those ideas, mm -hmm. even though I spend less of my year in in China because you know, I mean, I don't have to be there to con consider the elements. Yeah, um, the future's like, now. Yeah. Like that picture, yeah. picture behind me, for example. Yeah, is a portrayal of a Beijing apartment block, you know, which were built uh, largely without any external foreign influence until, say, the 90s, you know, mid-90s. Uh -huh. And then uh, that's when, the, you know, money started coming out, China became more wealthy, and people start to look elsewhere for ideas, for design. And so now um, architecture, you know, buildings are, uh, architects come from everywhere, you know, and the technology of materials, you know, how to build a building, how to make something better than it was, they're at the forefront because they're spending so much focus, you know, yeah. on how to get the, how to get better buildings for, you know, even for 
for cheaper even, you know. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so wants. we have like the late Zahadi, the uh, uh, Persian UK architect, who you know was the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize. She's got three main uh, buildings in Beijing. You know, they're sort of like honeycomb shape, and they're for, for China it was a challenge because the Chinese workers, you know, the ones off the street, mm -hmm. were not accustomed to not something that wasn't, you know, square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had to get curved walls and you know curved surfaces yeah, by yeah. patch concrete being molded and. And it was difficult, you know. It's, but they got it. They got it. And now there are three of those things in uh, in Beijing, and more other uh, opera house in Guangzhou. I think is also designed by her. I mean, at one point, I, I met Zaha Hadid in Beijing yeah. a few years ago. What's it like? And she she had an office sure. in Beijing, architectural office, and I think from memory she had something like four hundred workers, employees, architects, and whatever. That's awesome. Just in Beijing. That's how big it was, you know. And if you look at Zaha Hadid, uh, well, I looked at Zaha Hadid's website, she had hundreds of projects, all, you know, unique and uh, and inventive. Uh, that's what, that's how it is. And she's broken the ice for other architects to use uh, the, the 3D component where the uh, the idea of recta rectilinear buildings, yeah. you know, it's not 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 no longer the only way to, to do things. That would be nice. Yeah, I don't get changed up. Yeah. So if you ever what were coming to Beijing, um, the first thing that I noticed when I was there the last ten years mm -hmm. was how quickly things get done. You know, I have two subway stations near my studio, which have which at the time, so let's say, I can't remember, 2011 or 12, might have been yeah. a year later, but they were a brand new line for the subway, you know, because uh, it's a growing area. They put two subways within a, a mile of each other. Fantastic. And Seems a bit odd, but yeah, fantastic. But, yeah, but it's all like, uh, you know, not marble, but that, that marble composite. They were air-conditioned, escalators, the, the fastest subway carriages, in Beijing at the time, they had to build the tunnels. Two subways were built to get both together were completed within six months. Holy shit! How many people? Holy six months. Crap. Yeah. That's like working well, all day all is, night long, right? I mean, or like, well, can you work all anywhere else would take t ten years. Yeah, plus, yeah, yeah. Well, so these were you could catch this up one one minute. You saw the uh, scaffolding. Six months later, you're catching the subway. Oh my god! Why are wow? Is that through just like manpower, or through just raw architecture, or is that through just everything altogether, just the drive? I think, yeah, I think what that's what they call a can-do culture. Damn, you know? damn, they are shit. Well, but the thing is, what happens there is that some of the here. downsides were that you go and look at four in the morning, people were welding at four in the morning, and some of them without goggles, you know, without the uh, protective stuff. Like... So what that means is uh, uh, it gets done, you know, willy-nilly, you know, no matter what. So, I mean, there are enough people there that are willing to, you know, uh, break a rule of, or a hundred of them. Mm. Um, Interesting. To get it done, you know. So, uh, same with the, uh, you know, there are something like 69 brands of automobiles in China. Uh, not two or three, like there are anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. 69. 69. The, the thing is, um, most of the, or all of the brands are not dependent on exports to sell cars. You no, know, there's yeah. enough people in the country to buy them. So, there's a kind of a cyclic thing where, uh, Within 18 months, they can completely transform the engineering design of a car simply by just making enough and get enough, you know, income to produce the next uh, level of, you know, design. Yeah, you're blown and I was reading that. somewhere before that it took, I think, Japan 50 years to get on top of the automobile industry, you know. And now there's 69 companies? Holy shit. 69 companies. 
Holy so, shit. Uh, it's you a lot, yeah. No like, idea what and to buy. The thing, and the, what's the thing is with 69, there's virtually a car factory, not in every city, but yeah. in every, certainly at least one in the province, you know, so that, so they divide it up. So, you know, BMW, I think BMW up to the, uh, I think even the 500s are made in, in assembled in uh, Beijing, in, in China. And the Audi up to six, I think, is made in China. And then, you know, the higher up, higher end is maybe imported. But so, and then those factories share to make other, you know, other brands. Sharing, whoa. The, okay. So that, you know, that there might, out of, if, say, we look at 69 brands, they would be distributed in almost as many cities. So 69 brands of automobiles are made in 69 you know, give or take, cities. So there's a lot of employment and there's a lot of development and stuff like that. So it's, you know, well, you know, we have to say over the last few decades, it looks like it's the new order, you know, that's yeah. how, how things need, need to get done. And uh, so for anybody else, it's you can't copy what China's doing. Although I think India will be next doing that stuff. Do and a lot think, of the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. India, uh, yeah. kind of, you know, Philippines, Malaysia, all that stuff. They, you know, they they, they see, oh, gee, they can do it. We we should be able to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And but the other countries like uh, where manufacturing and labor is like prohibitive in price. Mm. Well, we have to think of something else, you know. We we have to think of uh, other other avenues where. Uh, where culturally we can excel, you know, because yeah. th those areas, I mean, even China is now farming out manufacturing because they've learned that uh, from 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 the rest of the world, from yeah. Americans, from yeah. everybody else, yeah. that eventually you you can get it made somewhere else cheaper, yeah. and you just focus on the management and on the you know, development, design, development, all that stuff, you know. So there's, you know, it goes up incrementally in terms of the intellectual, if you like, content of, uh, you know, what's what's being made. We're living in the future, it seems. We are really living in the future. Like, like apart from the flight cars. Yeah, look, I was in Detroit maybe three years ago. Mm-hmm. Just, and it was still in the, you know, I went to some interesting coffee shops and you could all, at the time, you could almost see that there's a rebirth, you know. That, I hope uh, you're right, I really do. I really do, I yeah, pray that. You know, people are thinking hard, how else can we make the city uh, viable, you know. Because the, the auto industry is gone, the, a lot of manu big manufacturing is gone, all the employment's gone. Yeah. And uh, when I was there, I couldn't believe how beautiful the architecture was and how much yeah. everything everything's essentially needing attention to keep it, you know, to keep it intact. Yeah. And I've been reading lately that, uh, you know, people are looking at very different ways, very different ways of uh, uh, using the urban territory yeah, for, yeah, for like sustenance, you know, yeah. how, to, how to make the best use of the land. So I guess that's what we're doing, you know, and this, this planet, planetary concern that we have applies as much to, uh, I suppose you could call it a spent environment, you know, that, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be ghost town, it can, can it can, we just have to reinvent, you know, a new path. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Lawrence, we are going to be coming close to the hour here, so I guess that's going to be it for today's podcast, sir. Um, yep. Thank you so much well, for your, your time, man. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, Daniel. And we'll, I've got lots of other stuff. Maybe we'll do, do another episode. Oh yes, please! I'll I would love to have you back up. Please, please do, please. I'll tell you just uh, as a as a teaser. Oh yeah. My three three bywords for this year. Yeah. Three bywords are not balance, 
I mean, not bacon, lettuce, and tomato, but balance, luck, and timing. Balance, luck, and timing. And balance, luck, and timing. And, you know, just as a close, cl cl closing, Vegas has been a, a place where I've actually managed to use the term Zen living. Really? Uh, In Vegas? Yep. Really, really? Uh -huh. In Vegas? And... and uh, I couldn't use that term elsewhere, like in Australia or in China. Yeah, I it can't came up in Beijing. It was not not like something I fabricated. It just, you know, while I'm actually getting on with life. So you feel that way in Vegas? Yeah. Remarkable. So that is probably another hour of how we can get that, given, you know, what's happening in the U.S. How, how can you get that, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's why. So yeah. I'm back there probably late August in Vegas. Okay. Um, so if you like, we could talk about it then. Sure. Well, do you want to give the podcast a few name of anything on that you want to recommend or show or anything that, that people can check out? Any websites, anything you want to plug? Anything you want to plug? <laughs> Anything I want to plug? No, well, if you spell my name, it's actually Lawrence Tan. Yeah. And just put lawrencetan.com. I mean, the website needs, uh, I need to come up with the uh, updated images and stuff. But, it, you know, you, you get all, you get information from there. Sure. Uh, and I hope to update it very soon. No worries. Fantastic. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Well, thank you again, Lawrence. And uh, that'll conclude this afternoon's Awesome America podcast. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And thank you again, Lawrence. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure, sir. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.